Surcouf was a large submarine of the Interwar Marine Nationale, or French Navy, that was pretty much the living embodiment of rules lawyering, and in large part responsible for some major loophole closing in the next naval treaty. Submarines had come out of the First World War as a much changed and evolved form of warship compared to how they'd gone in. Instead of small, short-range vessels with minimal weapons, they were now large vessels that were even trying to be part of the battle line in some cases, with varying levels of success. Then the Washington Naval Treaty put in limits on the gun calibre and displacement of most major naval units, including cruisers. But submarines were one of the exceptions, being practically unregulated. Thus, once the initial wave of scrapping, economic recovery, and reorganisation had been completed, various navies started looking for ways of getting around the treaty limits to gain an advantage over their competitors, whilst technically keeping to the treaty restrictions. And so, France, along with a number of other countries, took a look at the role of cruisers, whose numbers were now, of course, limited below the levels that any nation with a serious overseas empire was strictly happy with. For the Marine Nationale, these ships' missions included keeping contact with the various French overseas imperial possessions and search-and-destroy missions against enemy warships and merchant vessels, both alone and in squadrons. Then they asked, but could we do this with a submarine? And so the vessel that would become Surcouf began to be designed, intended to be the first of many cruiser submarines. The primary armament was not torpedoes, but instead a fully sealed gun turret carrying a pair of 8-inch guns along with a considerable magazine of 600 rounds. Two 37mm cannon and four heavy machine guns in two pairs were also installed for anti-aircraft work whilst the submarine was surfaced. Torpedo tubes were carried as well, but in a rather interesting arrangement. Four full-size 22-inch tubes forward, and then two sets of swivelling triple launchers mounted atop the aft hull in flush sealed mounts, more akin to a destroyer or cruiser's armament for surface action. Each of them had a single 22-inch torpedo tube and a pair of lighter 16-inch torpedoes for a grand total of six 22-inch and four 16-inch tubes. Due to the space taken up by the magazine for the main guns and the intended mission of the submarine, only a single reload was carried for each tube, plus a couple of extra 22-inch torpedoes. The main guns had their own fire control director and range finder, but due to being a submarine, and thus not extending all that much above the surface, the range of Surcouf was considerably more limited when it came to its main guns as compared to identical weapons mounted on heavy cruisers. This was largely down simply to not being able to see as far. Even using something as simple as the periscope for a little bit of additional height added considerably to the gun's effective range. They did think about a collapsible mast for even higher observations to extend the gun's range still further, but decided against it on the grounds that the rather lively natural roll of a submarine on the surface in typical sea conditions would make this more a form of cruel and unusual punishment than a practical method of spotting the fall of shot. Instead, the submarine would also carry a small float plane in a hangar after the conning tower, thus making it also a one-plane submarine carrier, as well as a submarine cruiser. This aircraft was supposed to both locate targets beyond the sub's limited spotting distance, and also provide direction for the fall of shot in engagements at long range, which would allow the guns to be used out to something approximating their physical maximum range, even if the crew aboard would have no sight of what they were shooting at. Taking the role of cruiser quite seriously, the Surcouf also had a considerably long operational range. A boat for inspections and general purpose work was stashed away somewhere, as well as space for passengers, or prisoners, or prize crew, depending on what you wanted to do with it, and a respectable surface speed of just over 18 knots, with 10 knots possible underwater. It should be very little surprise, then, that the submarine was huge, displacing over 3,200 tonnes surfaced and over 4,300 tonnes submerged, a size that would not be surpassed until the I-400 class of the mid-1940s. <laughs> 
and this was in a period where a displacement of around about a thousand tons was considered to be quite large for any other kind of submarine. The Surcouf would be laid down in 1927, launched in 1929, and commissioned into service in 1934, with the lengthy trials period between launch and commissioning raising a number of issues with the main guns. For example, they took several minutes to prepare for action once the submarine had surfaced, and due to being a submarine, the role of the vessel was quite pronounced, and both firing and training the turret was only possible when the role did not exceed a relatively minimal degree. And of course, engagement in poor weather or poor visibility would be severely constrained due to being unable to launch the float plane in these conditions. But by the time she was commissioned, her appearance, along with the British M-Class, had caused an additional stipulation to be added to the London Naval Treaty, which now also put restrictions on submarines' displacement and armament in a manner similar to surface ships, making further vessels of this type illegal. And so Surcouf would be one of a kind, gaining a special exemption to the new limits in a manner similar to HMS Hood under the Washington Naval Treaty. Through the rest of the 1930s, she would receive a number of minor changes, experiments with an autogyro instead of a floatplane, a revised shape of conning tower, and a new radio setup being the most visually obvious. World War II found her refitting when Germany invaded France, and with German troops bearing down and the vessel pretty much half disassembled internally, she made for Plymouth in the UK despite being unable to dive. However, with the official French surrender, the various French naval units in British ports faced the same ultimatum as the rest of the French fleet, albeit that unlike Mersel Kabir, the French vessels in Plymouth and elsewhere were generally dealt with without loss of life. Sir Couf, unfortunately, was the only exception, with a couple of men on both sides dying in a somewhat pointless small arms engagement inside the sub after it was boarded. Nevertheless, with the ship thus in hand, the refit was completed and the sub was handed over by the British to the Free French Navy, although it remained a sore spot in Anglo-French relations, eventually necessitating a British officer and two sailors later being assigned to it for liaison purposes, as for some reason the political allegiance of the submarine seemed to be constantly called into question. Fulfilling the role of a cruiser, Sir Couf would then spend the next little while escorting convoys in the Atlantic, until in mid-July 1941 she was sent to the USA for a further short refit. Following a short training voyage, the sub joined a small free fl French flotilla, and then took the small islands of Saint-Pierre and Miquelon from Vichy French control, just in time for Christmas 1941. As these islands were on the American side of the Atlantic, and the US Secretary of State had just agreed to guarantee Vichy French possessions in the area, this caused a little bit of an international incident, ultimately leading to President Roosevelt demanding that the islands be restored to Vichy France, and de Gaulle predictably refusing, and presumably telling him to go away, or the Frenchman would taunt him a second time. Unwilling to actually go to war with their British ally, the Americans kind of shrugged and mentally began preparations for having to have further dealings with the rather rambunctious leader of the Free French. With the Japanese entering the war in the same month, it was then decided to deploy Sir Kouf to the Pacific campaign. But this is where her story would end, as whilst en route for the Panama Canal, she vanished without a trace. Theories about what actually happened began to vary almost from the start. A freighter reported hitting an object in the area that night, possibly a submarine. A Catalina also reported attacking a target, possibly a submarine, also in the area, and also on that same night. The submarine USS Mackerel reported engaging a U-boat during the same period, and a bomber formation from Panama also reported attacking a large submarine in the area at about the right time. And these are just reports for which some confirmation of the activities of the attacking or accidentally ramming ships can actually be made. Knowing Sir Goof's luck, it's entirely possible that all four of them happened to it. Um, but ultimately, with the wreck currently undiscovered, 
we cannot say for certain what Sir Koof's final fate actually was. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.